what is the musicality of being? The idea behind this phrase is that music is a metaphor for our lives. And I'm not the first person to come up with this idea at all. I'll be mentioning a few people who have helped me think this through. But in each moment, many, many different things are happening in our experience, many different sensations, many different thoughts. There's a lot going on in the environment around us. And then when we interact with others, the same thing is happening for them and then we meet. And so how do we make this work? So if you think of a musical ensemble, they have to coordinate, they have to do something together in real time that involves both making sound, but listening to each other as well, modulating the volume, being in tune, being in the same kind of rhythm, and weaving together melody, harmony, rhythm into something that is really greater than the sum total of what each musician contributes. And music, of course, sometimes has words, but instrumental music, it carries meaning. And maybe it's not so easy to put into words what that meaning is, but of course, if you just think of a favorite piece of music, think of listening to a symphony, closing your eyes, any movie that you go to is going to have that moment in the movie where music is used to convey something of the emotional quality or the psychological experience of the characters. So understanding your everyday experience as a kind of a musical flow or sometimes something that doesn't flow, something that maybe feels more like noise than music, well, this, this is a really helpful tool for beginning to gather together those many, many elements of experience into something coherent and meaningful. There's simply too much going on in any given moment for us to pay attention to everything. What are you seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, thinking, and what 10 things might be going on in the surrounding environment? It's too much to track. So one of the most important things that your brain is doing at all times is deciding what's relevant and what isn't. Professor John Verveke of the University of Toronto has coined a phrase. Well, actually, I'm not sure if he's coined the phrase. Uh, I think there's a number of people working on this, but he often talks about, in any case, this idea of relevance realization. And it's just this. Out of all of these different things that you could pay attention to, including all of your memories, everything that you've got from past experience, how do you meet this present moment with all these variables? And how do you choose among them what to pay attention to and what to do in conversation, perhaps what to say, or even just in your internal dialogue, what to think about in this moment? If you try to kind of puzzle it out and work with all the variables, you'd never get anywhere. So we just do this automatically. But it's something like the process of deciding what's important and what isn't, what to put in the foreground and what to have in the background. And as Raveki points out, really a simpler way to think about this is caring. What do you care about? What do you not care about? What do you care about? And so caring is crucial to making meaning. And also crucial is having an intention. When you think, you're thinking about something. If you're with a person and you're talking to them, your thought is directed outwards. It's directed beyond yourself. So that is a situation that it, it implies this, this kind of musical relationship. 
when you talk to that person, are you in a flow? Are you in a musical kind of exchange of call and response? Or are you clashing? Are you fighting? Now, another thinker on this subject of music as a kind of metaphor for life is the philosopher John Rusin. He has a book called Bearing Witness to Epiphany. And the subtitle is Persons, Things, and the Nature of Erotic Life. And he goes quite into depth about this. And those three categories of musical structure, rhythm, harmony, and melody, he points out how these unfold in our daily life. Rhythm being those cyclical things like our breathing in and out, or waking up in the morning, going to sleep at night. Harmony being the many simultaneous layers of experience, kind of what I've been talking about here all along, that many things are happening at once. And they provide the sort of the backdrop. So if you and I are having a conversation, but we're in a busy restaurant and it's cold, well, that whole atmosphere that we're in might be sort of like the harmonic backdrop to the experience that we're having. And then when I speak and you speak, and there's sort of a succession of ideas one after another, and maybe they go from one place to another, that's kind of like melody or narrative, right? In music, the melody is on top and it's sort of the line that we follow, but its meaning is also very much dependent on the harmony and the rhythm below. So it's possible to begin to listen for and feel into these musical qualities in your daily experience. So a simple thing is just to track your breath, of course. But then if you were, for example, to take your pulse simultaneously, you would feel that your heart is beating and your breath is going in and out. And there's two different rhythms there. So there's, you could call that a polyrhythm. That's what you say in music when you have two different rhythms simultaneously and then they create a more complex rhythm. Now, why is that important? Well, because you are breathing, your heart is beating at all times. And so there's a certain quality of rhythm that you carry in your body. And then when you're with another person or you're in the environment where there are different rhythms happening, there is a relationship there. It's not important because you want to, you know, come up with a mathematical equation that determines how your breathing and your heartbeat might relate to the way the birds are singing in the tree, but having a sense of what's happening inside you and what's happening outside you, and that there is a relationship, that it's not just two things happening at the same time with no relationship kind of clashing against each other. That's more like the feeling of noise. This allows us to begin to sense in a broader kind of sphere of experience, much in the same way that a musician does in an ensemble. She doesn't just play her instrument, she's listening to how are the sounds that I make resonating with the sound of the whole band. So there's a number of different ways that we can explore this. A lot of the work that I'm doing these days under this kind of uh, umbrella of the musicality of being, it grows out of the work that I have developed by training in the Feldenkrais Method. And the Feldenkrais Method, of course, in the situation where I'm seeing clients and I'm working through touch with my hands, there's a direct interaction, there's a dialogue between us, between our nervous systems, between our physical bodies and their movements. But often Feldenkrais, like many other modalities, is a situation where a teacher is leading something and then all the students are individually doing something on their mat. There is a, a certain exchange there, but it's not so much uh, dependent on this kind of moment by moment connection. But what we learn through practicing the Feldenkrais method, how to improve our breath, how to improve our posture, how to improve our movement, how to improve our capacity to pay attention to ourselves, all of these elements, all of these 
these skills that make us better, um, shall we say, anchored in the world, they can also come into play in a dynamic interaction with another person. But that's a different way of listening than what we normally do in a Feldenkrais class, lying on the floor, listening to the teacher and listening to one's own body, not so much in relation to what everyone else is doing. I've also been drawing on my experience as I'm currently training in the art of circling. This is a relational modality. This is a training led by Guy Sengstock. And circling takes place. What it looks like when you see people circling is it looks like they're having a conversation. But there's a very intentional way of listening, which is listening to more than just the words of what the person speaking to you is saying, but listening below to what, what are the emotional qualities here? Or what do I see happening with the gestures or the expression on the face? And when you say that, how do I feel? You say something, how does that impact me, right? And then I can share with you how that impacts. Often we're impacted by what people say, but we don't share it. Circling is a kind of authentic uh, relating kind of modality. There are other modalities that also are based on principles of authentic relating. But the point is, the more that we share, the more that we're vulnerable, the more that we reveal what's really happening for us, then the more we're offering to the other so that they may respond. And they may understand how their words, how their actions impact us. Now, to take this back to this musical idea, one of the things that often happens in music is the phenomenon of call and response. Like in a lot of popular song forms, you have a lead singer and they sing a line and then the background singers are echoing that line. And it's a call and response, call and response. And as John Rusin points out in his book, everyday experiences like that, simply to walk outside you can experience call and response because it's raining. And so you put up your umbrella. You responded to the call of the rain, right? In the same way, an emotion, a memory that appears for you, it may call you to do something. So there's a way that even though we often think that we're dynamic uh, actors, we have free will and we choose to do this and we choose to do that. The fact is we're always encountering the world and the world is calling to us and then we respond. And so this too is something that we can begin to notice when we understand kind of how this phenomenon unfolds. To experience the musicality of being just as a way in, what I like to point out to people is that there are four elements of your experience that are always present. There's actually more than four, but these four are pretty important and pretty useful. And those four things are your breathing, your relationship to the ground. In other words, if you're standing or sitting, the, the surface that's supporting you, the experience of the surrounding space, and the experience of sound. And all of these phenomena, they take place both inside of us and outside of us. My breath goes into me and out of me, and it has a certain quality. That quality tells me something about my overall sense of comfort in this moment. If I'm having trouble breathing, something isn't quite right. If the breath is flowing, that's, that's probably means that I'm, I'm better fitted to my environment in this moment. How am I relating to the ground? I could be sinking into the ground. I could be kind of collapsing, or I could be finding a support that helps me lift. And this sense of lift or sinking, it tends to relate to an emotional quality. So when we feel lighter in our physical body, it tends to correspond to a lighter kind of mood, to feel heavy. It's, it's not that you can't 
have a good day while having bad posture. <laughs> but generally speaking, there is a correspondence between these things. The space around us reflects our sense of just comfort in the environment. If I'm unsure that things are safe, I'm likely to contract into myself. I'm likely to move away from the surrounding space and being contracting into my body. But when I'm comfortable, I can expand outwards. And I can begin to notice sometimes that in fact, I feel really expansive in one direction, whereas in the other direction, I feel less expansive. I feel more that I'm contracting. So sometimes habitual shapes in our posture, it might be because of a past injury or something that happened, but it might also be how we tend to relate to space. For example, when I was growing up, my father always sat on one side at the dinner table and my mother always sat on the other side. Just my relationship to my two parents, I might relate one way to my father and another way to my mother, and I might do this again and again, and I might begin to kind of create a shape in my spine throughout my body just based on that relationship, right? So there's something external to me and there's this dynamic interaction. There's this music that's unfolding. Sound, of course, is maybe the most obvious kind of literal translation into a musical sense, but there's always sound taking place all around us, including the breathing, for me right now, I can hear cars driving by outside that window. There's a little bit of a buzz from my computer here where I'm making this video. And so that's the backdrop. As I speak, I enter into the soundscape, but am I aware of the other sounds? Am I speaking in such a way that it's musical in this space or am I just sort of just blaring with my voice and making noise that clashes with the other sounds here? And when we're together with others, we notice that one person's voice sounds melodious. Another person maybe speaks a little too loud or their timing is off. They, they begin speaking before it's their turn, right? And they, they clash, they kind of create a dissonance in the music. So all of these things are happening at the same time, but where do we put our attention? Well, in this moment, maybe my breath, but in the next moment, maybe your voice. So it's a dynamic flowing interaction, just like a piece of music, but like a great musician who's really in the pocket, who's really in the groove, who's really hearing what's happening all around them. We can develop this capacity to improvise beautifully together if we begin to have a sense of how these different elements come together. It doesn't mean that all of these different things I've mentioned are something that we're paying attention to at all times, but being aware of this structure of experience, then we can get a little better at swimming through it. So before I end this video, I'll just mention that as I'm recording this, I have a workshop coming up on the musicality of being, and that's Sunday, February 13. I'll put a link uh, where you can find out how to register for that workshop if you're interested. Also welcome your questions about the musicality of being. And thanks so much for listening. See you soon.